Hey, Joe. Welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to have you here. We're talking Python to an R person. What's going on here? <laughs> what is happening? I know, right? <laughs> Cats and so dogs weird. living together. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, it's great. Glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you bet. So we're going to talk about Shiny, which has traditionally been a UI framework, a web framework for kind of rad, rapid development for R applications that need some interactivity. Yeah. But you have a, a big release for the Python people. That's yeah. also interesting and worth talking about. So that's the, the topic of today's show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hope uh, you starting out mentioning R that people haven't dropped off already. <laughs> I promise no, no. this will, <laughs> we'll have lots to say about Python and, uh, yeah. and Shiny for Python. Of course, I'm sure. Shiny for Python is going to be super fun. Before we get to that, though, let's get started with your story. How did you get into programming R and then what brought you over to Python, at least yeah, temporarily absolutely. or partially? Yeah. Um, my background uh, was in web programming really more than anything else. Um, I got into programming actually through desktop publishing and graphic design. That was what mm -hmm. I was really excited about. Um, and in college, that turned into web design. I, I went to college from 1996 through 2000, so that the height of the dot-com sort of craziness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just found CD myself- CD Baby and of, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Pets.com. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pets.com. That's right. <laughs> um, and I, I just found myself sort of pulled into just all the cool things that we could do on the web and mm -hmm. went from sort of front-end web development, which meant something very different back then than it does today. Um, I mean, HTML, right? Kinda. HTML, yep. Basically, string interpolation as a career. That was, uh, that was what I was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of led me into really falling in love with programming as a discipline. And I got more into the back end, more into sort of closer and closer to the systems level programming. And I just really enjoyed being sort of full stack, um, mm -hmm. both on uh, the website and even um, spent a few years doing Windows desktop programming uh, just to kind of see what that world is like. And um, one of the things that I, like one of the best things that happened to me early in my career was um, hooking up with JJ Allaire, who's the founder of our studio and the founder of two other companies that I worked for previous to that in Boston. And um, I got, kind of got to the point in my career where I was more interested in the people I was working with than the technologies or even the you know idea. Uh, I knew I liked startups and I knew I liked working for JJ and the people that he had around him. And he got excited about R. I, I don't, I think his friend who is like a high school science teacher somehow got turned on to R and JJ was fascinated by the fact that this is in 2008 or 2009, there was this GPL licensed platform for doing what traditionally people would do in very proprietary platforms like um, all these statistics packages that you might have been forced to learn in college, you know, back in uh, the 2000s. And here was this pretty rough, pretty raw, um, but all the pieces were there kind of platform for doing all this stuff with code. And yeah. he immediately saw something and I definitely saw nothing, but um, I <laughs> believed in JJ and I he had the idea to build an IDE in a web browser for this R language. And I was like, I don't see the chain in thinking that leads you to think that this is a good idea, but also um, sounds super fun. And I would love to see if it's possible to build an IDE for the web. And so in the beginning, really, I was in R completely by accident. And I didn't even really learn much R as I was building, helping to build the uh, R Studio IDE. That's um, kind of the irony of those types of platforms, right? 100%. Like when I talk to people about Jupyter Notebooks, they're enabling Python people, but they're writing TypeScript. That's exactly <laughs> you know, right. That, That's right. That, how, what's the story for our studios? I... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a crazy story technology-wise. Um, well, the part that's not crazy, this, the, the sort of hardcore server bits are written in C++, but the front end... <sighs> The front end is written in Java, which is then transpiled to JavaScript using mm -hmm. uh, a, a package called Google Web Toolkit, which... Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. 
Oh, okay. So you've heard of GWT. I haven't um, written anything with it, but yeah, I know it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in a world before TypeScript and before React, this really was a godsend, like to be able mm. to have static typing and the right sort of abstractions um, to be able to really build large scale. I mean, our studio is a giant, giant piece of software, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And um, I think the very best JavaScript developers can write code bases at large of pure JavaScript, but not me. <laughs> like I definitely needed <laughs> the crutch of, uh, you know, static time, uh, static type checking. And um, anyway, uh, yeah. And working on our studio ID was a blast and it, the best thing about it was I got to meet so many data scientists and uh, well, at the time we called them statisticians. Now they call data scientists, but um, learning what they do, what the problems they were solving was so interesting. And that eventually uh, led to Shiny. And that's when I really started getting serious about actually writing our code in my day to day, uh -huh. um, which was a, a fascinating journey in and of itself. Yeah. Well, I would say that your faith it was well placed, right? Even if you're like, I'm not sure about this R Studio thing. I think it's, I think some people have heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It it really has been such an incredible, um, such incredible ride. And there were many steps along the way where I was like, ah, this does not really make a ton of sense to me. But JJ has proven out time and time again that um, things that he cares about. It turns out that there are other people that care about it. Um, so he was really super into reproducible research um, before it was on everybody's lips. And he, uh, he really spent a lot of time trying to make that world better for R. And, um, and by then, I'd certainly learned to uh, sort of trust in his instincts. And, you know, just time after time, there have been many bets like that that have, have paid off really well. It must have been pretty gratifying to, see, to work on this project and then talk to these data scientists and say, you know, here... Oh, we're doing this work at the Large Hadron Collider, or we're doing this work yeah. to solve cancer, or and and let me, you gotta, can you help me with this? I'm trying to like work on this protein folding, or you know something like that, right? It was, yeah, it was probably with some really cool experiences you had like that. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think the first time I ever um, demoed Shiny in particular um, at a user group meeting, and I was super nervous and and went a little overboard on having like lots of demos. Um, mm. And one of them, uh, this is back in 2012, was charting the spread of, um, of AIDS throughout the world and showing the sort of levels rise and fall as time went on. And um, it, it was interesting at the time because AIDS was sort of receding as, as education and, and drugs were getting better, except in South Africa, it was getting much, much worse uh, mm -hmm. before finally starting to get better because, of, well, because of many reasons. Um, and so I showed this demo and then afterwards, a friend of mine who um, I didn't know what he worked on, I just knew him through these user group meetings, came up and said, uh, oh yeah, I'm working at, uh, I think he was at Fred Hutch at the time, working on um, you know, an AIDS vaccine and we're using Shiny to uh, basically be the bridge between the biostatisticians and the biologists and looking at the results of these you know, assays or whatever it was that they were analyzing. Yeah. And I, that was just blew me away and, and absolutely every conference I go to every, you know, many times a year between then and now, I've just been humbled by the kind of things that people are doing with Shiny. Yeah, I can, you know, I can really, I hear some stories like that as well. And I, I imagine it's just 10x when you're building developer tools like that. So how about now? What are you doing day to day? Yeah, um, I, well, my title is CTO. Um, that is uh, an honorary title that I think reflects that I was um, the first employee, um, but I don't do traditional CTO type activities most of the time. Uh, my day to day, I help lead the Shiny team specifically, um, which is a team of um, maybe 10 or 11 right now, uh, mostly engineers. And we split our time between Shiny for R and Shiny for Python. Right now, probably more on the Shiny for Python side, given that there's so much more to do. Mm -hmm. um, and Right now, I am in the thick of it, writing features for the next release of Shiny for Python, um, uh, really getting to lean into um, React. I'm, I've been working with um, some really fun like headless table libraries to, uh, to build data grids uh, with you know, fast virtualized scrolling. Uh, that should be um, a really nice addition to Shiny for Python for the next release. OK, yeah, that sounds really cool. 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about Shiny itself. I suspect a lot of people on the data science side have heard of Shiny, even though it's in the R space. I know the conversations come up around it. Other ones that kind of live in a, a similar orbit, maybe, or you know, Streamlit. Yeah. I've had Adrian on, the founder of Streamlit, on before, and we've got Dash and Panel and Pinecone and others. So, you know, that sort of sets the stage for what this could be about. Maybe give folks a, a sense of just what is shiny and it's you know, maybe in, even in its R form originally, and then we can talk about the Python side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so shiny is a, a way to create web applications easily without having to learn a lot of web development technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it especially, is JavaScript. Specific, especially JavaScript, especially JavaScript, hundred percent. The interactive part of, of all these, like this callback hits that. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, um, and it is. It was conceived primarily for data science. Um, it is. I think a lot of the ideas behind Shiny are are quite general, and we'll. I'm sure we'll, we'll delve more into that. But uh, we in the in the creation design of this. Um, we really are laser focused on data science and the kinds of problems that people want to solve by creating interactive um, visualizations, interactive reports, and uh, even like workflow applications, but all of it around the analyzing of data. Um, this was in 2012, this was like a pretty radical notion. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of, of skepticism from um, some people close to us who were thinking like, you're going to make data science, you know, like why would data science uh, scientists want to become web developers? And, um, and I think this was, the answer was like, there are really a lot of problems that uh, they can solve using interactive artifacts, but the whole point is that they don't, do not have to become web developers. Yeah. Um, I was going to say like, you should turn that on its head and say, they don't want to become web developers, which is exactly. exactly the value proposition, right? They want to share their work and they want to make it interactive and collaborative. Yeah. But the last thing they want, generally speaking, is to like, oh, and now I'm diving into Vue and React and yeah, yeah, yeah. all that stuff, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that being said, I think um, I personally am you know, I've been doing web development since uh, basically 1996. And the idea of working day in and day out on a project that was really sort of like a, my first website type, uh, you know, like the, something that had a lot of guardrails, something that really limited you to um, whatever few tools were in its toolbox, that wouldn't be really satisfying or interesting for me. So even though Shiny is designed to be very easy to get started and for you not to have to know JavaScript or anything like that, if you do know JavaScript, if you do know HTML and CSS, if you, you know, live and breathe that stuff, um, but you want to create a, a convenient way to create data science um, related applications, uh, Shiny really lets you lean into those skills as well and use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to enhance or customize or extend Shiny for your own purposes. Uh, it's really okay. important to us to, to capture sort of both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about the programming model and how it works, but I think maybe the first big contrast that I'd like you to set up for us is you know, thinking of the Python side now, like why not just Jupyter Notebooks? Why not yeah. Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab and just, we have that. that that's on yeah. the web, sort of, kind of sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Depends how we want to put it up there or share it or let it be executable. But, yeah. you know, sure. Com compare, compare it to that. I think it's pretty different, yeah. but, you know, I think it's something that people maybe want to get their head around. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, you're right. I mean, you hear a lot of the same words being used, right? Like, uh, you know, it's browser-based applications that do interactive things. And I think the difference is that Jupyter and Jupyter Lab, um, those are sort of the places where uh, data scientists can do work, right? Where you can ask unbounded kinds of questions from your data. Uh, that's where you iterate, where you um, do exploratory data analysis, where you, um, you know, write functions and things like that. Um, and yeah, you do have this beautiful immediacy to the results that you get, right? Um, that's why everybody really loves working in, in notebooks. Uh, and Shiny and, and frameworks like it are really for um, communicating outwards. Um, it's really not for the data scientists to write code for their own understanding most of the time. It's really about creating a web application 
um, to, to show somebody else. Uh, so you, it, let's say that you, um, you know, are collaborating with some people that are, you know, don't have the programming chops that you do, um, that have never launched a REPL in their life or installed Python. And you want to give them the ability to ask questions of your data and of your analysis. Uh, maybe what if scenarios or, or, or in the simplest case, think like a BI dashboard or something like that. Um, like nobody's asking why, uh, you know, execs need to look at a BI dashboard instead of running SQL queries on their own, <laughs> you know, inside of a, inside of a console. Uh, and this is similar. So if you want to create an interactive artifact for other people to consume, uh, then shiny and frameworks like it, uh, come into play, uh, and, and, and Jupyter, not as much. I mean, you can certainly save Jupyter notebooks and then sort of share, um, you know, a link to the published notebook, yeah. but uh, the the interactivity is uh, either non-existent or more limited when you when you do things that way. Right, absolutely. You don't want to give them the full notebook because the last thing you want is the general public typing Panther right. <laughs> code in there or arbitrary Python code. Um, but you want to give them some interactivity. Um, you know, maybe we could look at this little example down here, just to. You know, just talk through like what a, a, an app might look like. Right on the homepage, shiny.posit.co, you have, you know, I think this is kind of a, a big statement towards your commitment to Python. It's like right on the homepage, on equal, on par with R, it says get started with R, get started with Python. And you scroll down, That's it has right. the R and the Python code, right? Like they're, they're not yeah. like, oh yeah, we also, we're making an attempt at this Python thing. But you've got this example. Do um, you want to just give us a quick, Sure. Talk to you what this app is. It looks like it evaluates things about ducks, and that's all I can tell about it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> stuff about uh, this. This is using the Palmer's penguins uh, data set, rather. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so on the left, we have a sidebar with a number of controls. There's two select boxes. Uh, there's some check boxes, and then there's a couple of toggle switches. And on the right, you have a matplotlib generated uh, scatter plot with some marginal plots added on. And um, th this is sort of the hello world of Shiny, where you have one or more outputs and some inputs that when you change them, the output automatically updates. Um, in this case, you can decide what variables do you want uh, to apply to the X and Y axes, and then you can filter it by the species of penguin. And, um, and then there are a couple of toggles to just um, decide whether you want coloring by species and whether you want the marginal plots or not. And, um, you know, it sort of does everything that you would expect it to do um, when, you, when you select and deselect those, um, those values. Yeah. So, for example, you have filter by species and Gen 2 is checked. But if I uncheck it, the whole UI redraws with just showing the other two species of penguin. And you can turn the species on and off in terms on whether or not like it highlights, you know, based on that. Yeah. You've and, got to drop and, and down to... for different things you might compare and you can just w toggle those and the UI changes kind of like you wrote a fancy front end JavaScript framework where that's, that's happening behind the scenes, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear, when you say the UI redraws, we're not talking about a whole page reload. I mean, it's not 1998. Um, uh, it is, you know, the things that uh, need to update, uh, update on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting way to create programs. And there's, there's a couple other things I've seen that are like this, but I really, I think it's, it's a super slick framework. Um, before we get into it, Thanks. Diego's got a, a question. It says, could Shiny be used to do fancy math, say for someone trying to upload their GitHub website for their PhD thesis model? Like, what, what can we create? Like, could you create a kind of a LaTeX looking integrated thing with interactive math bits in there? Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, you do have the ability uh, to do, well, I, I could interpret that question one of two ways. Yeah, how one is, yeah. yeah <laughs> can you do the computation uh, you know, for this PhD thesis model. And, and in that case, absolutely. It's just whatever you can express in Python or R for that matter. Sure. Um, and in terms of uh, putting like LaTeX equations on the screen, yes, um, this is a completely built-in feature for 
uh, Shiny for R. And for Shiny for Python, it's a little less slick, but we do have an example uh, application that shows how to drop in. Um, it's based on MathJax, basically. So you can include the resources for Math MathJax and then write your um, equation in in a uh, LaTeX format. And uh, and yeah, it'll it'll render. Uh, Diego, okay. I hope that opens, answers your question. <laughs> hope so as well. Yep. Seems like it. All right, so let's let's jump over to the GitHub for uh, GitHub page for a minute here and talk through some of the things that you all call out right at the top. So um, it's open source for one, right? That's mm -hmm. a big deal. I, it's under mm -hmm. the MIT license right here on GitHub under pi dash right. shiny. Yeah, um, I should add, uh, you know, full disclosure: we are. Um, we are a for-profit company. We are a B Corp. Actually, we're a benefit corp, um, but we are for-profit. And uh, Shiny for Python is completely open source, MIT licensed, no, no sort of um, gotchas there. Um, but we, when it comes to deploy your Shiny app, we have a variety of different ways you can do that that we offer as a company. Um, we have an open source on-prem solution called Shiny Server. Uh, we have hosted cloud you know, um, you know, cloud hosting that we manage that you can easily deploy to, and we have free and paid tiers. And we also have Posit Connect, which is a sort of a more comprehensive platform for enterprises to allow their data scientists to communicate with the rest of the organization. And that has like very robust enterprise grade Shiny for Python hosting built in, and that is a paid product. Um, okay. And Does it have like uh, special ways to access like your SQL server on your enterprise, you know, like access uh, more uh, authenticated access to data or uh, authentic off to the thing itself to protect it and so on? Yeah, for sure off to the thing itself and it integrates with your, you know, LDAP or SSO type systems. Um, and it, it helps um, with scaling your application. So it will sort of monitor how much load each of your Python processes is getting and then spawn, you know, automatically uh, scale up. Uh, it can, you know, hook up to um, Kubernetes in the back end so that your shiny apps the Python computation is happening, you know, in pods on the back end. Uh, so lots of lots and lots of different ways that it sort of tries to make things easier. Sure. Okay. Cool. Very cool. So basically, short story is Shiny for Python's open source. I could take the on-prem open source thing and just host it myself if I wanted. I presume that means I could also fire up a virtual machine in the server uh, in the cloud and, and install it up there and kind of <laughs> that's my on-prem if i wish yeah absolutely and th this is yeah. also shiny for python is built on top of starlet which is the same mm -hmm. um underlying framework that fast api uses so um it's almost true that anywhere you can host fast api you can host shiny for python oh, oh interesting just put um, some g unicorn uv corn workers in front of it uh, except g unicorn yeah, the only exception oh, okay. is that um, because Shiny for Python is stateful, and we can talk more about that um, as we, I'm assuming we're going to talk a little bit about yeah. how we compare yeah. to some of the other things out there. Um, we, uh, we do need, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to load balance across multiple processes, it does have to be a stateful load balancer, um, which is, you know, normally quite easy to do, but G Unicorn is not stateless. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, it's, sticky. It's stateless, yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. 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 So, so you need a sticky load balancer. Um, and uh, oh, I should I should also mention that Hugging Face is another place that you can deploy Shiny for Python apps these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, I think that that's a, a certainly a fair trade off. Um, so the commercial side uh, of your story, which we you know started talking about by opening a new company and going to work on that, is really about um, sort of Shiny as a service and Shiny. A shiny cloud so it's easy to like take not worry about the deployment side right the app itself the framework itself is about not worrying about writing web stuff the deployment thing is still it's still a, a deal right if you just say and then just get dear data scientists you fire up your linux machines and you keep them up to date and secure and you like that's that doesn't feel great to a lot of data scientists either i'm sure <laughs> yeah yeah that's right so i think uh with with our open source on-prem hosting, it's like that. It's it's just a piece of software that you install on Linux. And um, with Connect, it's more like your IT department sets this up for you. And then you straight from your, um, 
you know, from your local machine, once you have your shiny app working, you just type in a command like RS connect deploy and point it at your server and everything gets taken care of for you, including, you know, getting all the right Python dependencies installed on the server and using the right version of Python. And, um, hopefully the, the act of, um, you know, we have we have customers that are writing multiple new shiny apps a day and deploying multiple new shiny apps a day. Wow. And you know, okay. they're, the usefulness of that app might be a day or it might be, you know, five years. And we want to serve both sides of of that spectrum. I suspect that does make a lot of sense if you're a data scientist exploring something. You can be like, hey, look, I, I came up with t this today. What did you think? And it maybe the next day, based on feedback, you do something completely different, and it's yeah. become irrelevant, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know what? One interesting thing about this is, you know, you hear about something like Shiny for Python, like, you know, Streamlit or, or Dash, and you think that this is, you know, this is really about displacing, say, uh, Power BI and Tableau, right? But, but actually, uh, in our experience with Shiny for R, um, the first thing it displaced were gigantic PDFs that people were sending around, you know, like <laughs> I have generated all of this data for my analysis. I don't know what you want. So here is like a 500 page PDF filled with tables for you to go explore. Um, mm -hmm. And with shiny, you, you can present something that's much more interactive. That's that makes it much easier for, you know, some domain expert on the other side to find a needle in the haystack that, that you happen to right. be working. Well, you don't, you completely remove that cycle, that iteration that's cycle right. of, well, what if it would? What if we used a different number for the this you know constraint here? What that's if we right. only filtered? It's like that's part of the UI. That's part of what you deliver is that interactivity. And as far as displacing things, it sounds like you're displacing SharePoint. And if that could just be completely <laughs> erased from the world, that would be awesome. Yeah. Because every interaction I have with that software, of sharing like corporate doc sharing, is just like oh boy, yeah. here we go. Okay, um, let's. Let's take it top to bottom, maybe for here in this. Although I do have to point out, I, I could tell you still have that love for R because it's still zero point two percent R. <laughs> I love it. It's it's forty seven percent Python, forty seven percent JavaScript. Yeah, zero point two percent R. I just want to make it clear: you do not have to install R to run Shiny for Python. I think that R is there's a couple of scripts that we use that we we grab resources from the Shiny for R P uh, repo repo. And I think, um, you know, that was one of the first things that <laughs> one of our programmers did and they didn't know Python yet. <laughs> so <laughs> they wrote it in R. <laughs> That's fine. It's fine. I just thought it was funny that it's, yeah. it's there, but just, just, a, just a shade of it. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing that you point, on, uh, point out here is uh, how is Shiny different from some of the things I said that it was like, for example, Streamlit or Dash? Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe, maybe touch on that a little. Sure. And I think really the one that comes up the most is Streamlit. Um, man, mm -hmm. Streamlit really has taken the world by storm, it seems like, since they came out in, in what was it, 2018, something like yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's 2018. So, yeah, it's only been a few years. Um, it clearly really resonated with the Python world. Um, and I, I, I do have to say, I, I was very taken aback by the simplicity of their programming model when it first came out. And, um, you know, I pay a, a little bit of attention to, you know, new things that come out and purport to be high level web frameworks. And most of the time they were sort of um, like, okay, I recognize the trade-offs that they're making here. Um, but the mm -hmm. Streamlit one was definitely a very bold choice that they made. Um, Streamlit, I think it feels to me um, that they really prioritized ease of getting started and having the simplest possible mental model um, in, in an, a, a much higher level of priority than everything else, um, which is a bold stance. And I really applaud them for being sort of clear about what their vision is. Um, so Streamlit is unbelievably easy to get started with. I think primarily because, I don't know if you've done a lot of Streamlit, but it, but it has this top to bottom execution a little, model. A ton, but yeah. Yeah. Like if you were to start out with not a Jupyter notebook, but like a regular Python script that was doing a bunch of data analysis stuff, you know, reading data, um, maybe doing some some transformations and then outputting some, you know, tables and plots. Streamlit lets you take that sort of straight up and down script and sprinkle in some Streamlit inputs and outputs, and boom, like you have now written an interactive Streamlit app. You just say, you know, Streamlit 
run and then the name of the file and it just works. And um, in that sense, it's it's quite incredible. Uh, it's very easy to get started with. Um, and the the cost to spin up a new Streamlit um, app is is so low that um, uh, I was actually talking to another uh, to a YouTuber, uh, Finilo. I, I don't remember his last name. Uh, I think there's one Finilo in the Streamlit world, and um, <laughs> he was saying that he actually uses this instead of Jupyter Notebooks to do um, interactive, mm. uh, you know, exploratory data analysis, which I thought was interesting. Um, but the the sort of drawback of having this simple of a model is that um, it really works well for the simplest apps. And then uh, the model is a little bit too simple for even like moderately complex. It's not even complex, but just like you're, you sooner or later um, will often in a surprising way smack into, you know, some surprising wall. Um, and uh, this is not something that is theoretical. We definitely have talked talk to a lot of uh, Streamlit users. And even the happy ones will say, we really, this is just for prototypes and then we throw them out uh, because you just cannot, um, you can't think of Streamlit apps as something that can grow with you as your, as your needs grow. Um, so I think the sort of time from zero to value for Streamlit is almost zero. It's incredibly mm -hmm. quick. Uh, but the time from value to the time of, okay, now we're going to throw this thing out. And the last 20%. Um, it, it, yeah. And it, it's actually not the last 20%. I think it's more like the last 60%. Um, and I mean, that might be uncharitable and I'm biased, but, but honestly, like in my um, using this framework, which is, it's not to take away from their achievements. It's in, it clearly has resonated incredibly strongly with a lot of people in the Python world. But I think, um, you know, no one who uses Streamlit seriously will tell you that you can do most of the things that you want in this sort of top to bottom execution model. Um, you will yeah. uh, often in, in surprisingly uh, quick ways run into limitations there. Um, and, and I do want to say like Streamlit, they recognize this. And after um, some time, they added um, some features that uh, try to give you ways to work around that top to bottom execution model. Uh, they introduced the notion of session state, and they introduced uh, multiple attempts at um, nice caching abstractions. And I think they make somewhat more complex apps possible. But I really, I mean, I'm happy to recommend Streamlit for those easy cases. I cannot recommend Streamlit uh, once you start you know, getting into session state. It really is quite a fragile paradigm to be coding in. And um, and by, by the way, I, I it, just to make it clear here, I, I don't have a huge um, financial like motivation to lie about this. Um, Posit Connect, which is the way you know we make money in this area, it is um, designed to host Streamlit as well, and we have custom like a lot of customers that do that. So it doesn't matter to us whether you sh you shiny or Streamlit. Uh, I mean, it matters to me personally, like it makes, it makes me feel good when people use Shiny, but um, as a business, we we 100% uh, love when our customers use uh, Streamlit. And, um, but but it, it really is, I think, um, we'll talk more about reactive programming later, I hope, but um, mm -hmm. what, it, what it doesn't give you is, is a nice model for the complicated stuff. It only gives you a nice model for the very, very simplest stuff. <laughs> Which serves an important role, but you know, also 100%. means that Shiny might serve an important role too. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience, I think maybe worth the diversion is: um, you got real-world examples of Shiny for Python that you could talk about? And I, I'll, I'll let me take a step back since this is so brand new. Let just Shiny, right? You got yeah, because I feel like the the feature set is pretty similar. It's just like the R people have been at it for a lot longer, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just to make clear, so Shiny for R has been around since 2012. Shiny for Python um, has been in alpha since last year, and we just took the alpha tag off in the last, um, I don't know, six weeks or maybe less than yeah. that. Um, yeah, so I think, um, I, and, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't come prepared with um, with any more links than what's um, on the website. Um, yeah, no worries. But there, there is well, a um, we have a Discord where people are starting to gather and and talking about some of the things that they're doing with um, with Shiny for Python. Um, so yeah, okay. like I think on the on the left here, um, if you select say orbit simulation, yeah, the orbit simulation is cool. 
um, this is a demo written by um, one of our engineers. Um, but this is using, um, well, first of all, we haven't talked about this, but this is actually using Wasm. So there is no Python running on the background uh, here. Okay. Um, this is using um, a feature side. of Shiny called Shiny Live. So this is using Pyodide, which is the same sort of Python in the browser technology that PyScript is currently using. And mm -hmm. uh, you still write your Shiny app using Python. You still don't have to write any HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, but when you uh, run it, you can run it you know, straight out of a web browser, as you can see here. Um, so that's why it took a little bit uh, longer to get started, is because it's installing Python into your browser and you know, installing AstroPy. Well, you uh, say so, a while. It took like two seconds the first time. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forget that. Uh, yeah. For your <laughs> listeners, they won't be able to. Uh, to yeah, see exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this um, this is a, an example of like a relatively uh, simple set of inputs and one 3D output uh, that I think in this case is being rendered with Matplotlib. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it is, you can choose some different parameters about the uh, the Earth moon and and sun and planet x and it has uh, you know arbitrarily complicated cal calculations happening on the back end by astropy to determine like how these bod bodies would move when they're affected by each other's gravity uh so there's there's a lot of um shiny apps that are like this that there is one particular algorithm one particular model uh that it's demonstrating and then um wanting to show what happens when you try different parameters. So this, I'd say this is sort of in the simplest category of shiny apps in terms of you know, what's easy to imagine here. Um, and yeah, there's some other stuff on the left there. Um, it, some of the, these um, example apps show the use of different widgets. So uh, there's one for Plotly there. You can use the Plotly mm -hmm. JavaScript-based uh, visualization library with Shiny for Python. Um, if you want your scatter plots to have you know, tooltips that show, you know, data, for example. I mean, this particular right. one seems not to do that much. Um, and, uh, you know, Wordle. you can use, yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a Wordle clone. I love how it looks one. like a, uh, it looks like a mobile phone keyboard. <laughs> yes, the way, you, I mean, I have a whole keyboard right here, but it's like, yeah. now you could type into the, the mobile phone keyboard. Yeah. yeah totally. Wordy? No, it didn't take it? Come on. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Those are just the beginning ones, right? You even have um, yeah. camera input. I don't know what that's going to do. I guess. Oh, this is designed for a phone. Uh, yeah. We yeah, have yeah. another I... example that's not on here that will use your webcam, but um, yeah, it's okay. But it doesn't, uh, I don't think it works on the WASM mode. So. Yeah. There's probably security limitations and, or other differences. Yeah. 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 Um, I will say one thing that you won't see as much here that you do see on Shiny for R is um, like interactive dashboards or, or even non-interactive real-time streaming dashboards. Not because the sort of underlying technology is not there, but because the actual like UI widgets for making something that looks like a dashboard is in Shiny for R, but not in Shiny for Python. But that is coming uh, within the next... Um, I don't know, hopefully a week or two weeks. Uh, so we have a new release okay. coming that adds a lot more UI stuff. And that that is a very, very common use of Shiny is for people that are creating dashboards that show, um, you know, key performance indicators and time series plots and, uh, you know, geographic data plotted on an interactive leaflet map. Uh, that's, you know, the bread and butter for a lot of data scientists out there who are using Shiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds very exciting and, you know, the kind of stuff that no one wants to do on the web. <laughs> Very few people want <laughs> yeah. to do directly on the web. You want to be able to just grab a library. Yeah. All right. So I sent us a little bit on this diversion here um, over those, but maybe the next thing would be uh, reactive programming. Yep. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. So uh, Shiny was really born out of this idea of reactive programming. That was the, the motivating concept. And uh, for people who haven't, um, heard that term before, maybe heard it, but never really were clear on what it means. Um, reactive programming is a programming paradigm that can be applied to you know, many different programming languages where um, it's about making it easy to program against values that are changing over time. Uh, so in a normal 
uh, you know, programming paradigm, if you have a value X, say X equals one, and then you have Y equals X plus one, and then you change the value of X, the value of Y does not change, right? It's not reactive in that way. Right. Whereas if you were in Excel and you had, you know, one cell using another cell plus one, then you would expect that to change. So Excel is sort of the most common example of a reactive model that I'm familiar with. And I see. So you um, wire up the data to say this, this number depends on these other numbers and this one depends on that formula. And it's the underlying reactive system just says, we're going to do the minimum amount of recompute to keep them up to date. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, so in this case, the values that are changing might be a slider that is in your user interface, right? And when the user drags that slider from zero to five, uh, there might be all sorts of downstream calculations that need to recompute now because you've changed that value. And um, in a world prior to reactive programming, the uh, dominant model uh, was, and maybe in a lot of places still is, callback-based programming or event handling uh, is the other name for it. And that's, if you've ever used a framework that had like something called an on click or something like that, <laughs> yeah. you're doing event handling, right? This yeah. button is pressed. I am going to execute this exact, you know, code in response to a button click. And in that world, which is a world that I inhabited for many years doing full time, very complicated UI programming using that model. Sounds um, like some desktop programming, maybe some C sharp, Windows forum, something like that. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. When I worked at Microsoft working on uh, Windows okay. forms apps that we, uh, yeah. that we shipped. Uh, and, um, and our studio was created in that, in that paradigm as well. And um, it's actually quite difficult to, to do that kind of programming well. It's very easy to understand how to code in an event-driven sort of way or uh, using callbacks. But to get your callback logic right as the number of um, events, the number of outputs, and the number of intermediate uh, sort of calculations um, as they increase, it's really hard to, number one, keep it performant, and number two, keep it correct. And um, it, it, the idea for doing a web framework for data scientists actually predates me finding out about reactive programming. And I actually said no. Like I actually, uh, JJ and I talked about it and I was like, we could do it and we should not uh, unless we come up with some way that is better than event handling. Because what I didn't want to do was make it easy to come up with answers that were incorrect, which is what I think um, callback-based programming makes it very easy for you to forget to update some aspect of your calculation. And now you have an answer. It's just not the right answer. Right. So, Maybe you update two graphs, but there's some number that has like a total in it. And yes. you forget in your event handler, you got to update all three. And so then and, and it look, not UI looks like it three. knows. But yeah. yeah, you'd have to update all three in the correct order potentially, right? Because yeah. one of those subcalculations might depend on the other. So the whole thing, you know, it, it is certainly possible to create uh, very complex or even, you know, simple to complex interactive stuff using uh, callbacks. But uh, I never felt like this was a great way to work. And when I was, you know, building these, these desktop apps, I often felt at the end of the day, like I had been operating at the very edges of my mental capacity. <laughs> um, and uh, it's even worse when you go to you know, modify existing code or, mm -hmm. or God forbid, have it. to help, yeah, debug somebody else's UI code. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it really is very, very difficult. Um, and I heard about reactive programming um, via this JavaScript framework called Meteor. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of Meteor. It, it was heard of it, but I haven't ever used it. Yeah, not a lot of people have. I think it was very influential in terms of its ideas, but um, it didn't catch on anything like, uh, like React. But um, Meteor, I heard about it in 2012, and it, I, I can't really convey how awe-inspiring it was to see, I think I saw like a five-minute demo that was on the front page of Hacker News, and, uh, you know, I was just flabbergasted at what they were doing in this demo, and there were like no event handlers anywhere, and yet everything was just completely snappily updating, and um, I was like, so taken aback by this that it's stuck in my brain for weeks. Like I was like, how do they do that? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. And um, I finally 
like did some Googling around and there was a Stack Overflow answer that indicated like this is sort of more or less how it works. And, um, I, you know, with that clue, I downloaded their source code and sort of found my way to how exactly it was implemented. And uh, I got actually was getting on a plane and I downloaded the repo before I got on the plane. I was like, by the time this plane lands, I'm going to figure this out. And, uh, and it actually is a beautifully elegant mechanism that, um, you know, I'll probably talk about someday. Um, it, I mean, we could talk about it now, but I think it would probably be the rest of this, uh, rest of our time. Um, but it, it, it's a beautifully elegant and, and ultimately quite simple, uh, mechanism that, that underlies all this magic. Um, and, um, that when I saw that and eventually it took me a couple of weeks to connect the dots, but when I realized, wait a minute, this could be how data scientists could create highly interactive things without fear, without worrying that they're going to forget to update some intermediate thing and get the wrong answer. Or worse, they wouldn't worry about it. They just get the wrong answer and then be angry <laughs> after the fact, right? Um, uh, we're going to retract that paper. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and on the R side, uh, it really has these ideas have proven themselves out um, year after year after year. I think people are building incredibly cool things in reactive programming with no background in software engineering, much less uh, much, much less hardcore front end uh, web development. So I, I really do believe, you know, there are a lot of different ways people are are solving this problem in Python takes and Pinecone and Solar, all these different ones. And um, the ones that sort of uh, have thought carefully about this problem of how do you help people programming against what is inherently a dynamic system while staying safe, while making sure that you're getting the right answers every time uh, and doing it in an efficient way. Those are the ones that I, I think are, are closest to the spirit of Shiny. And, and that's really why I think Shiny for Python um, needed to exist because, I mean, I looked at Dash and Streamlit, and I just felt like, you know, yeah, I, I'm glad that people are really getting a lot of a value out of these, especially um, out of Streamlit. But I really feel like this needs to exist as well. We really need like an industrial strength reactive framework uh, for things that are not just top to, top to bottom execution. Yeah. One thing that's standing out to me on the page here is you talk about there are a few utility functions to help manage or a few utility things to help manage reactivity. And one yes. is um, context blocks, you know, with isolate and the other ones mm -hmm. are decorators for functions. And, you know, just those two things are pretty, pretty solid Pythonic constructs of the language. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, at, it looks like you put some thought into not just writing R code in Python, but trying to embrace some of the Pythonic language capabilities. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it was really important to us uh, when we were talking about the design philosophy for Shiny for Python to really make it a Python first experience. Um, and and that's, um, that, that's not necessarily, um, like I think the other choice is defensible too, which is let's make these two frameworks look as similar as possible so yeah, that you can sure. seamlessly move from one to the other. And um, I was just not convinced that um, anyone would really enjoy writing our style code in Python. <laughs> like I wouldn't, I mean, that just feels, <laughs> something feels hacky about that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, de we definitely spent some time and, and I'm not new to Python. I think I learned Python originally in 2003, something like that. Um, and, and I've spent some time with the language. So I, um, yeah, it, it felt to me like um, so much of Shiny is, uh, this reactive programming is about creating independent units of either this is code that generates a plot or this is code that calculates a data frame and um, taking those little bits of code and deciding when is the right time for each of them to run. Um, because there are like dependencies between these different blocks. And, and the notion of these being functions that have decorators on them felt to me like a pretty spot on analogy, right? Like you're mm -hmm. creating a chunk of code, which in Python is a function, and then you are annota annotating it with uh, an, an indicator of your intent. Uh, so in Shiny, yeah. you would write, you know, for a plot output, you would say def plot one or whatever you named that plot. 
you would have your matplotlib code inside. And then as a decorator to that function, you would say, uh, this is an output. And the type of the output is a plot. Um, now, I will say that being said, uh, I have been a little bit surprised how many data scientists um, in Python I've talked to have not worked with decorators. It's not, I mean, most of them uh, are familiar enough, but uh, like a non-zero amount of people have told me like, I haven't done decorators before, and this is a little bit scary. Uh, so yeah, that sure. was not something that I was anticipating going into this. So, yeah, so I got a couple of thoughts. One is, if you went with your alternate reality, where you said, let's make them as identical as possible, there's certainly a case to be made for that, I agree. Uh, but that would sort of say the primary audience is the people that flows between R and Python. Which exactly. is certainly non-zero, but is not like let's try to resonate most deeply with just the Python community full stop rather than the, the transit folks, you know? Yeah, that's right. So that's right. I, I would say, I mean, looking in from the outside that this looks like a good choice. Second, uh, the, the, the with concepts and the decorators and data scientists is I think one of the powers of Python the reason a lot of data scientists use it is you can be really effective with a partial understanding, a highly mm -hmm. partial <laughs> understanding of what Python is and how it works, right? Like you might not know how to create a class. You might not even know how to create a function, but you can still pip install a few cool libraries or conda install them and then run top to bottom five Absolutely. lines that generate an amazing output, right? And yep. so I think there's a, not talking about all data scientists, but I think there's a, a slice of kind of pretty new to Python data science who are like came from somewhere else. Like I heard this is awesome and I'm starting to get some traction with it, but even they haven't gone into, you know, crazy concepts of decorators that take functions, start arg, wraps them and returns other right. functions. You know, like that said, from a syntactical perspective, I think it's pretty easy. Like, oh, this function, it has to be reactive. So I put at reactive event on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Amir um, asks if there's uh, any examples uh, with user authentication. I know uh, yeah, you guys have a, a your question. gallery, which is yeah. what I, I, I skipped before, but the gallery I think is maybe easier to quickly browse, but there's more in the examples. Yeah, and, and honestly, we, we are a little behind on the examples. Uh, we spent a lot of the last uh, six months working on features and not <laughs> on examples. You're been, <laughs> you've been busy building the thing, not yeah. talking about yeah. what you could yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think we need our examples to catch up a little bit. Um, I will say that um, user authentication is something that we um, have as part of both our hosted platform and for uh, Posit Connect. So I think a lot of companies that are trying to sort of have a similar business model as us um, and have a um, open source framework and uh, also um, some kind of enterprise hosting often draw the line that way, that that authentication is one of the things that isn't in the framework, it wraps the framework. Uh, that okay. being said, in Shiny for R, people definitely went ahead and wrote their own packages that put authentication into the framework and made it open source. Uh, and I'm sure those things are going to happen in uh, Shiny for Python very quickly as well. Yeah. How similar is the execution model, like the internals, what's happening conceptually on the server? stuff or yeah on the web side yeah the... um i would say from there's a couple ways to answer that um i would say right now it is surprisingly close which is not really what we were anticipating um shiny for python is written in async io and mm -hmm. that that async framework is quite different than how async works in r um and I think we, after, you know, spending a lot of time on this implementation, the mental model for the Shiny app author is actually quite similar. Uh, so where we ended up, I think it, it does, for all intents and purposes, as an app author, it's a very similar execution model. Uh, so each user, uh, if, you, if you were to launch a Shiny for Python app right now from your um, not from Wasm, but like using a regular Shiny for Python, running it out of Python, and you connected three web browsers, they would all be running in the same process. Um, each one gets their own copy of their their own session 
basically. Um, so there's no confusing whose inputs are applying to whose outputs. Everybody has their own copies of inputs and outputs and they're wired together. Um, but it's all running on the same process and it's all running, uh, currently they all run on the same thread. Um, we do that on purpose because you can also have shared reactives. So, um, you know, you could have global variables that essentially when one browser updates them, everybody gets an update uh, and you could have some kind of shared scoreboard or a chat room or, or whatever. Um, that being said, uh, if you want, you can also do async. Uh, so your outputs and calculations can also be async functions. And um, therefore, your session, if it's doing some kind of long running async calculation, can give up its uh, you know, um, control of the thread to some other session that can execute. Right. Or it's doing some database thing where it's pulling yeah. in a bunch of data can say, we're waiting on the database. You guys keep going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting short on time here. Let me, let me ask you two more questions. The first one is, I think from a community perspective, like what, what opens up now, right? So we have R and we have Python and there are similarities between these, but there's really smart people doing creative and powerful stuff on both sides. Like because of the, the chronology, I guess, mostly I imagine that there's more shiny work that's happened on the R side than on the Python side. But you know, how much does this make it possible for people who maybe wrote a book with shiny for R and they might want a, a Python version? Right. It seems to me that like having this as an option, like if the whole UI is now kind of almost equivalent, if not, you know, syntactically identical, like, oh, all of a sudden we could have these these two versions or we could move from one side of that fence to the other and still stick with Shiny and the same reactive programming model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to make sure I get your question right. Are you talking about people who are sort of in the shiny ecosystem who have like extension packages and things like that? Or are you talking about people oh, or who just write shiny apps? People who write shiny apps, people who are like, yeah, users creating the, these shiny apps. Maybe they create yeah. them in shiny for R and they're like, I've always wanted to do a Python one, but I really like shiny. So I'm not going anywhere, you know, yeah, but yeah. now there's shiny for Python. You're like, Oh, maybe this is a way to have that as an option. Right. Or I'm a teacher That's teaching a class at a college and I did it with shiny and R and they're telling me I have to use a, move to Python. I thought I'd use Streamla, but maybe now I can move over. Like is how, how yeah. much do you see that scenario coming into play now? We absolutely are. Yeah. And, and I think I underestimated this a little bit. I think what I was anticipating is that people who are very comfortable with shiny for R uh, and comfortable with R in general might see shiny for Python as sort of a threat as mm. uh, you know, the, the shiny team has given up on R and all they care yes. about is Python now and they're selling out to the Python you know, crowd or whatever. Um, and that really has not been the case at all. And then Joe, um, you come on this podcast and oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, the, that's, the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm just um, kidding. <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, it's, it's almost been a sense of relief. Uh, and that applies as well to, you know, our company name was our studio. We rebranded Deposit. And similarly, uh, you know, we announced both things at the same conference uh, that we were going from our studio deposit uh, in terms of our company name and Shiny for Python is now going to be a thing in addition to Shiny for R. And I almost feel like the predominant uh, emotion that we got from our community was relief um, because I think unless you're in like very specific fields, there's nobody that doesn't have some Python around them right? That maybe your team does R, but then you have this sibling team that, you know, maybe is more ML model heavy and they definitely mm -hmm. use Python or your IT department really is a lot more comfortable deploying Python. And I think um, as much as people love R, knowing that they have the option, knowing that they can take these ideas that they really like from R and be able to reuse them in Python, um, I mean, yes, there will be some syntax to learn, but that, that's never the hard part, right? I mean, the hard part is <laughs> no. everything that you express the using libraries the syntax. and the UIs and all that, yeah. Yeah, so that's really what we've heard is that people, even if they're like totally happy with Shiny for R, they're happy that Shiny for Python exists because they know that if the time comes where they have to add that to their um, toolkit, that it's an option and they don't have to now try to map 
everything that they know and take for granted from Shiny uh, to have to map that to Dash or to Streamlit mm -hmm. or Panel or something like that. Yeah, you know, another example is you work at a university where R is actually really has a, a good stronghold, right? It has a, especially yeah. in the math and statistics department. But maybe you, you were working with some astronomers and that their whole research group does Python and you want to work right. with them, but you know, like you also want to bring shiny, right? So yeah, yeah. that's what like that, all that conversation right there kind of encapsulates why I thought this would be a really cool topic to have you on the show is, you know, it kind of opens up this bridge yeah, for a lot of people in a lot of directions. Yeah. And speaking of bridges, um, a member of my team pointed out that, um, you know, he's someone who in, in his previous job uh, went from an R organization to like a more Python heavy organization. And as someone who's coming from the R world, um, it can be a little bit intimidating, uh, you know, to sort of start at the bottom of the ladder again, especially <laughs> if you're in some kind of you know, a uh, yep. team situation where you're expected to, to be productive and to contribute to the team. And um, Shiny for Python, especially being new, um, the people are coming from the R world and sort of find themselves, whether by choice or involuntarily, um, you know, needing to do Python, that, that Shiny for Python might be an interesting, uh, like you said, bridge uh, for them to go from one ecosystem to the other um, while maintaining a certain level of familiarity uh, and to be able to deliver a lot of value because, I mean, one of the, the reasons I think Shiny uh, really resonated on the R side is because the things that you build with Shiny, if they have value, they are extremely visible. They're extremely visible to your coworkers mm -hmm. inside your organization. And um, it, it really, I, you know, you're, you're talking about how, you know, people coming up and saying how they've built impactful things with, with Shiny. Another common theme I heard was um, how much Shiny helped their careers. Um, going from doing work mm -hmm. in, you know, a REPL or, or a, a notebook and instead being able to deliver very dramatic interactive applications um, is a really powerful way to, um, to, to have an impact in your organization. It is. And I think data scientists, and especially this kind of like visual, let me turn the knobs and see what happens type of experience is the type of person that has the ear of pretty high up folks. And if, if you've got powerful tools like this to make a, a good impression, and you're like, they asked me, I, I asked them if they could give us predictions of this or if they could rethink this. And they came back with a new web app the next day. Are you kidding me? It took us six yeah. months to redesign our stupid website for the whole homepage, you know what I mean? Something <laughs> like this, right? And so it yeah. lets you look good, right? To the, the right people. That's right, 100%. Yeah, yeah cool. Joe, I'd say you're making a, a big impact here. We got Alan out there saying, I just started using Shiny during this live stream. Yes. <laughs> How hard <laughs> is it to deploy this into an AWS EC2 instance, for example? Yeah, you totally can. Um, so I, I think um, the easiest thing to do is to look up Shiny server. Um, most of the documentation talks about, um, you know, you, you might find it on the R side of the website, but it's it's actually all the same. So it it is, uh, you know, if you're using Ubuntu, it's a uh, it's a simple install of a Debian package. If you're using, um, you know, Fedora, it's an RPM, um, and uh, and it should be pretty easy uh, to to get started with. Um, but also, don't forget that you can also just sling it into our um, our free hosting, um, especially if you're just getting started. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, roadmap. Let's close it out with roadmap. Yeah. Uh, so in the upcoming release, we have been um, focused a lot on UI components. And um, that's something that we're going to continue to focus on for a while. Um, I think um, we definitely want to make uh, the more dashboardy type um, applications uh, very easy to write. And um, we also are uh, wanting to beef up on the output side uh, some of our some of our widgets. So we don't have a great table widget right now. It just kind of takes a pandas table and renders it to HTML uh, using pandas um, styler. But um, we want to have a um, fast um, a fast scalable uh, virtual grid, basically. Um, and also for our um, for more interactive type outputs like that, um, I should mention that we support IPy widgets natively. 
So um, most IPy widgets will just drop right in, including uh, Plotly and PyDeck and um, well, you know, most of them uh, work mm -hmm. just fine. And uh, and we'll, we'll be doing more to um, sort of make some of those feel a little bit more native. Uh, and the IPy widget stuff works great, but um, I think we also want to make it feel a little bit more functional in some cases than, uh, than object-oriented. Um, yeah, and uh, we have a lot of examples to write, a lot of documentation to write, and um, and there are also quite a few um, features to port over from uh, from Shiny for R. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that um, automated testing is something that we are working on as well, um, making it easier for you to write automated tests for your Shiny for Python apps. Uh, it's an approach that's based on Playwright that we use internally right now. Um, mm -hmm. but we're going to have helper classes and functions to make it um, a little um, a, a, a less boilerplate -y to to write these um, kind of, kinds of tests for Shiny for Python apps. Nice. Playwright's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, yeah, yeah very, very cool. Like Selenium, but m more Pythonic, so pretty yeah. neat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a, a cool roadmap. Uh, if people want, if they've got ideas, they want to reach out to you. Is GitHub an option? Like, a, do they open an issue? Do they email you? How do they reach you? Uh, yeah. So we have um, a disk. A GitHub issue is always appreciated, um, and we um, will absolutely read those and engage. Uh, we also have a Discord for things that are a little more, um, you know, if you want a little bit more of a back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. And or you just want to just want to meet us. You just want to talk about uh, you know any of the design decisions we've made or how we might be different than um, you know X Y Z framework. Uh, we're happy to talk to anyone and everyone. Uh, and I think to get to the Discord is on our GitHub uh, homepage. Got I believe. It. Excellent. Let's see if I can find a Discord. There you have it. Join yeah. us on Discord right on the homepage in the readme of the the GitHub. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Joe. Great. Thanks for being here. Thanks for creating this. This is cool. I, I think it's a, a, a nice contribution and really, like I said, it's a cool bridge between the R and Python communities. Oh, thank you. Um, if you don't mind me saying so, I, I really enjoy your podcast and I think that you are, you're quite good at this and um, I just really appreciate all the conversations that you've had. You seem like a, just a really generous interviewer and you do a really great job of, of sort of um, helping, helping people really feel uh, three dimensional, even when we're talking about like very technical stuff. So I appreciate that. I I really appreciate that. That's that's super kind. Thank you for saying that, and thank you for being on the show. So, yeah, my we'll, pleasure. We'll put all the links in the the show notes for all these things. People can check them out there. And yeah, see you next time. All right. Thanks so much.